the false positive rate, the, the fraction of your tests that come up positive, though they do not have the virus, if that's greater than the, what's called the prevalence, the fraction of people who've got the virus, it doesn't matter how hard you try and you can't subtract it, you will end up with most of your positives being what are called false positives. They don't have the virus, they're not sick, they won't get sick, they're not contagious. And you may have noticed, Julia, and that's possibly why I was thinking about this for over the last few weeks. Have you noticed that when we get so-called um, uh, surges or peaks, you know, Leicester and so on, almost no one was ill? And, and, and that figures now because I think between uh, five times and ten times the number of, uh, of sorry, only one-fifth or one-tenth actually had the virus. These are the ones that are true positives. And so the problem is if the false positive rate is higher than the prevalence, you cannot use the assay. There's nothing you can do to fix it. Uh, so and I believe this, 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 let me just finish this one sentence. It may sound controversial, but unless they can fix this assay, I believe they should stop pillar two testing because there isn't an assay that can do other than I have described to generate mostly false positives. So this isn't that oh, this is a peculiarly poor test. It's just this kind of testing in the community. And this is the big difference between testing in hospital and testing in the community. Testing in hospital, we call pillar one testing in the community, pillar two. Now, when you're doing pillar one, you're testing people who are already ill. Uh, they've got symptoms and you're doing uh, testing with medical professionals taking the test and they're going straight to the lab. And that, of course, has a much higher rate of reliability than a test uh, done by non-medically trained people in the community of, to a certain extent, a fairly random sample of people because a lot of people are going to get tested who haven't got symptoms themselves. They may think they've been in contact with someone who thinks they've got COVID. Again, odds are they haven't got it. So it's it's always, it's all, it's the number of people and the reason why they're being tested that's also the issue. Yes, you, you said it right. So the uh, pillar one test in hospital, uh, certainly just to take us back to that ghastly month of, of March where we're at the peak of infections and then in April, about April 10th, we saw the peak of deaths. And then for the last six months, it's fallen continuously. But back in March, uh, I've looked at the data and fully 30% of the people who were sampled were positive. So now it's 30% who are positive and then 0.1, 0 0.8% who are false positive. Basically, the effect there is instead of 30 out of 100 being positive, which and they do have the virus, you get 31 there's a what so you can see now the effect of false positives is irrelevant. Yeah. But now when there's almost no one who's got it, an average member of the society, of the public, ONS says it's about 0.1%, one in a thousand. 0.8% is this fixed uh, false positive rate. It's generating five to ten times more false positives than real ones. And earlier in the summer it was 20 times. So it's got to stop. They, they must not use this assay. It, it's producing ca catastrophizing. And also an important point, Julie, if I was if I was right and the government said, you know, Mike Eden's right, Carl Hennigan's right, let's just pull this test. There's nothing else actually happening of any great note. Yes, there are some in hospital. Yes, there are some dying. But as compared with the thousands dying every day, we're down to about 1% of that. And this, there actually isn't any fear that the government could provide. So it crosses my mind. I don't know why I'm not making a conspiracy, but if they wanted us to be fearful, the best way to do it is carry on using a test that produces but, mostly false positives because wherever they travel, that's what they'll get. And this is the thing. And the more testing you do, the more false positives you'll get. In fact, you'll make it more likely there will be more. But with 3,899 cases yesterday, we've been around that 3,000 mark, now the 4,000 mark. The number is going up. But we do know that the proportion of uh, positive cases of those tested um, is also going up so th there is there is a greater incidence we think of the virus in the community and we have seen hospitalizations go up and we have seen deaths go up but professor carl hennig at oxford university was saying yesterday and in an article and on television that this is the normal seasonal effect of getting in heading into september we are there is a fear that we are catastrophizing normal seasonal trends more people will die of flu more people will die of pneumonia more people will get colds more people will get covid that doesn't necessarily mean we're entering a second wave. Yes, ab absolutely. Um, it's absolutely right. I've tried to explain to people, and if people are listening to this and want to know more of the background, uh, it's uh, my new article in Toby Young's Lockdown Skeptics. I'm not a lockdown skeptic the first time. I have been subsequently. I think it's a dangerous, damaging intervention that cuts across people's lives 
And, and worse, it doesn't actually stop people catching the virus, they just get it later. So I don't think it saves a single life, but it deprives us of access to the NHS. Everybody knows that NHS access, they're trying their best, but, but they've been told for some reason to keep the loading of patients light. Seriously, I, this is my first claim and it's true. Um, they're keeping the loading on the NHS light, which is why you can't get the treatments and surgeries yeah. you want because they're planning for a second wave. Uh, and uh, Julia, if you just give me five seconds, I just want to repeat the strong request to, to Matthew Hancock and to Professor Ferguson. So if you believe there's going to be a second wave, then you must have evidence for that. What is the underlying evidence that you're re resting your case on? Because you seem to think there'll be one and you're planning for it and you're depriving us of the NHS and you're prepared to lock us down to avoid it. Uh, but I've looked and there's no evidence in the literature, whatever. And as Carl Hennigan says, we're definitely not in a second wave at the moment. When you look at the data, honestly, uh, there are more cases, but for the reasons Carl Hennigan said, I think at most we're in a second ripple. OK, thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Mike Eden, former chief scientific advisor with Pfizer, looking at those figures uh, really.